Welcome to Villain Dollar Moves, the show for the top US and Asia founders, funders, and execs. From the growing pains of a unicorn journey to IPO, scaling a venture capital firm, and the shift of wealth, we cover it all. And our next guest, Coach Jen. Before she was the first female to coach the NFL Football League in 2015, she was the first woman to play running back in the Men's Professional Football League with the Texas Revolution. Before that, she was a superstar in women's football with a highly decorated 14-year career in women's professional football, which included four world championships and two gold medals as a member of Team USA in 2010 and 2013 for the International Federation of American Football's Women World Championship. And of course, eight all-star selections. In other words, breaking ground is nothing new to her. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Villain Dollar Moves. And today I'm so glad to have with me Dr. Jen Welter, the one and only first female NFL coach, as we've seen, with a tremendous track record of really busting all the barriers possible. Now, to kick it off, you know, um, you know, I just want to start with just acknowledging the fact that, Dr. Jen, you've really been a trailblazer. We really, you know, stand on the shoulders of women like yourselves. And I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for, for the opportunity here today. You know, whilst our work is very much in terms of, uh, we talk about the founders, the funders, and the executives, a lot of times, you know, I, what, what I, I think is so real about your journey is how you played it big and made all these billion dollar moves. And, and as leaders, in our own different fields it's all about uh playing it big as well it's all about that mindset and, and how we're very much athletes in many different ways and that's why you know i thought you'd be a perfect next guest and really thank you for taking the time out and i heard after a couple of rips down <laughs> you're joining us so thank you so much how are you doing coach Shen? oh my gosh look anytime i can hang out with somebody who's making billion dollar moves i'm there because the truth is we all want to be surrounded by people who are great at what they do, right? And because then there's nothing we can't do, right? Like if I'm going to make billion dollar moves, I want a billion dollar venture capitalist with me so we can put our heads together and really change things, right? Because too many times I think we're stuck in silos, um, right? I know football, I'm great here. And then we go to move into other spaces and in other places and we have to find the best of the best. And so when we can hang out with each other, oh, you know, magic's going to happen. I, I wouldn't be anywhere else. Love it. Well, today, magic is certainly going to happen, Coach Jen. I promise you that. But let's get started and really dive right in into your journey. I want to hear all about, you know, how you started and really, you know, for the for the folks in the audience, many would not have guessed uh, that you started out wanting to be Billie Jean King, but then transitioned into a totally different sport altogether. So, so talk to us about how that started and uh, what got you to where you are today. Well, you know, I grew up in Vero Beach, Florida, where football is like a way of life. It is the sport. The whole town shuts down, you know, and I thought there were no lights brighter, right? And then I looked on the field and it was like, the guys looked like real life superheroes to me. And I just wanted to be one. And it was the first place in the world that somebody really told me that there was a difference between what girls could do and what boys could do. So it's kind of like I had a football crush from afar, right? It was like, you have that crush, you always hope they'll notice you back, but it wasn't my time yet. And so I fell in love with tennis. I played it uh, for years and years, was actually ranked at my highest time at like 50 in the state of Florida. And I think part of why I loved it is because it was the one sport that you could really see women on TV, right? And I thought they were everything a woman should be, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful, powerful, doing the darn thing, right? And nobody was telling them what they couldn't do. And then I went to a coach who was supposed to be the one to take me to the next level, right? right. And 
just want y'all to know, though I've done big things, they come in a really small package. And I had not yet reached my top height of five foot two inches at mm -hmm. this point. And I certainly had not found the gym yet. So this tiny little skinny girl goes to this new coach and he told me because of my height and my build, I would never be strong enough to play pro tennis. And it's not like I threw the racket down that day and just quit, but it was like, if it's not possible, why am I fighting to get on to court every day? And so instead of fighting to get on the court, I started finding other things to do. And um, yet, thankfully, what I did do is decide I never wanted anybody to tell me I, I was not strong enough again. So I started lifting weights before most women were and then actually really transitioned into team sports and found um, my place in my space because I didn't have to have all of the answers by myself. You know, that's the beauty of team sports. You can really be great at what you're great at and other people can be better at their own special sauce. And yet together, you know, we can take over the world. And I, I think sports are such, especially team sports are such great lessons for girls because we see that you're not on an Island. It wasn't like, you know, a solo sport like tennis. And what I found is that the energy that I brought and the competitive spirit that I had, you know, leveled up all of the teams that I played on. Um, and then when I got to college, I actually found rugby and mm -hmm. Boy, oh boy, that was like love at first sight. It was soccer meets football and they don't wear pads and I finally got to tackle. And so I love played it. for four years, got recruited mm -hmm. to the under 23 national team. Um, and at that time they told me at that level, even though I dominated everyone and was you know the number one prop at the tryouts, they said at that level, they could teach someone else to do what I did, but they could not double my size. So yet again, being too small stopped my athletic career. So there was a lot of times um, where I was told no, and it wasn't possible. And I'm curious to understand just from your journey there, and, and it's interesting that someone of authority, right? I, and I think you mentioned this before, a coach who we as young girls are, are taught to sort of look up to, tell yeah. us this is something we cannot do. How did you then sort of create that shift in your own mindset to say, okay, um, maybe he thinks this is what I can't do, but I think otherwise. And how do you keep going despite, you know, being told by someone who at that time, you know, you sort of uh, supposed to accept that as reality? You know, I think what's so hard is as kids were told to respect authority and to let them be the, the right. And not all of them are right all the time, right? Because the one thing that can never be quantified and should never be counted out is your heart, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't see your work ethic. They can't see your grind. They can't see your vision. And it's those same people that will tell you over and over and over and over that you're crazy. And yet we all know that there is a fine line between brilliance and insanity. And you have to be crazy committed, right? Because if somebody else saw what you saw, they probably would have already done what you were doing. And so being first, being an innovator, being a disruptor means that the majority of people are not gonna get you. And that means they're not mm -hmm. gonna know what's for you. And a lot of the times the advice that we get is from people who are speaking from the scar tissue of their own heart, from the loss that they experienced, from the pain and the dreams that they did not get. And they think that they're saving you, right? Mm -hmm. By keeping you from, you know, being let down. And yet at the same time, they're prohibiting you from actually letting you live. And I talk to people about that all the time because there was not one person who ever looked at me and said, you know what, Jen Welter, you'll be one of the best football players in the world one day, right? right. The coach didn't even think I could play tennis. I do sometimes want to go back and tell him though, you know, coach, you were absolutely right. I could not have been strong enough to play pro tennis. <laughs> I played pro football instead. Right. Right. But we don't 
we don't have that knowledge at that time, right? And yet the grind, the hustle, the what we are, the, the power of passion mm-hmm. means we can do crazy things and we can defy crazy odds, right? That's why it's exceptional because you are an exception. You are breaking the rules. You are doing those things. But even when I stepped onto the football field for the first time, right? When I finally got the opportunity to try out for that football team, I remember it was like this, this love that I'd had my whole life, but now it was close, right? It was like that boy I always had a crush on and all of a sudden he wanted to take me out on a date. And then you're like, Ooh, but what if he has the dead fish palm hand, right? Like (laughs) isn't as good as I thought, right? Right. And, and, you know, you kind of hesitate. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I can handle getting turned down again, right? Right. I don't know if I could handle them telling me I'm not big enough. I'm not enough again. Mm. And what I finally realized was, you know, I could live with being too small. I've been my too small my whole life. But what I could not live with was wondering for the rest of my life, what would have happened if I would have just gone out for that football team? Mm. And I say that and I tell that story because what I did not want to do was wonder what if for the rest of my life. We can get over rejection. We can get over not getting it, not having someone pick up the phone, not always winning. But that life lived of wondering what you could have been. That was what I did not want to be my narrative. And I say that as somebody who has made history multiple times, a eight time pro bowler, four rings, you know, in the pro football hall of fame, all those things, right? Like my, my $12 check, the first check I ever made for playing women's pro football is in the football hall of fame because I want people to know what that takes. And yet I could have been somewhere very different today if I would have let fear define me. I love that. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I do want to pick on a couple of points here, but let's start with then your transition to football. I heard, you know, part of your story, and that's why I, I, you know, want to bring you on the show to really unpack that. But I heard somebody wanted to benefit from some publicity of having you running around, and that really (laughs) turned things for you, and was really um, how you got got a leg in into where you wanted to be. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so you know, here I was, 2013. Okay, I finally get my PhD and win my second gold medal. So things are pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty good in terms of where you want to get to in terms of life goals. And yet got back from winning our second gold medal and my team, the Dallas Diamonds, one of the dynasties of women's football, they're no longer going to be able to put the team on the field. So all of us, some of the best women in the world found our team gone all of the sudden. Mm. And I get this call a few months, a few months later from the Texas Revolution, which was a men's indoor football league team. Right. And they wanted to meet with me. So I'm not gonna lie, y'all. I put on really tall shoes that day. I was gonna be at least <laughs> five foot four when I took that meeting, right? I gotta walk tall into this one. But I didn't really know what they wanted. And mm-hmm. It was an interesting dynamic, you know, having that PhD in psychology. I watched the coach who wanted to be anywhere but there. It was like he didn't want to make eye contact uh, because if he didn't ever make eye contact, maybe this wasn't happening and I didn't exist. Right. Meanwhile, the president of of the team was like, Jan Welter, we are so excited to have you. We think it would be amazing if you would go through a day of training camp with our guys. And I was like, oh, oh, so do you mean you want me to come in and smile for the cameras and run some ladder drills and catch some passes? And he was like, yeah. And I said, absolutely not. That is an insult to me as somebody who just won my second gold medal. And if I was any one of the guys on your team, I would absolutely hate it. If you want to do anything with me in this football team, either I do everything step for step, hip for hip, or I do nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And 
as soon as those words came out of my mouth, I knew without a shadow of a doubt it was happening. I was going to play pro football against men and I might have just gotten myself killed. <laughs> Good problems to have, hopefully. Good problems to have at that time, right? And and that's how really it begins, right? By questioning. And, and I think that's really important. Uh, you know, uh, part of what your story reminds me of is a lot of the conversations that are happening right now. I mean, you know, we're, we're um, sort of fresh off a lot of reckoning in our nation, the racial reckoning, the you know rise in hate crimes, and um, companies you know in my world seem to be rushing. Investors are rushing to seem to want to do the right thing, and by that that means bringing in sometimes uh, what can be seen as tokens, right? Yeah. So the token oh, yeah. woman, as, as you're saying this right now. So I I just wanted to um, put that in parallel here and try to get your perspective on how you turn that around, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, um, as in this case, right, clearly they wanted you to be the token woman. How do you turn it around to say, wait a minute, I deserve to be here and I'm going to train just as hard or twice or thrice as hard to do what I need to do, even if that means getting killed, but I'm going to do what, what's required of me. How do you do that? And how do you convince others who clearly didn't believe in you and wanted to look down? Right. You know, I think first thing, you know, we always talk about diversity, right? And, mm -hmm. and that's what we're talking about right now when you said a token woman. But diversity is only good as the actual inclusion, meaning inclusion and having a voice in the conversations, right? Because we are better when we have more diverse perspectives, right? We, we know this, there's research on it, the vantage points multiply, the angles that we look at situations, you know, all of those things are improved. So it has to be that when we change uh, those dynamics that might have been, you know, 100 percent male to now inclusive mm -hmm. female, that we as females make sure we don't leave our voice at the door. Mm -hmm. OK, we have to come to the room and bring it. Now, I also say we have to um, develop allies. And those guys on the football field, they needed to know two things about me. Number one, that I belonged. I was there for the right reasons. I was okay. there for the football. I was not going to throw up my hands and say, you can't hit me. I'm a girl. That was the job description. Running back, I'm getting tackled. That is the job description. Now, thankfully, um, we are talking more figuratively for a lot of people, hopefully in the boardroom. But for me, being there for the right reasons meant I was going to take the same hits, run the same drills, do the same things. And I was there for the game. It didn't mean I had to be the best, but I was going to give my best effort and get back up every time I got knocked down. And the other thing was that we could get along. And this is a really interesting topic when you're paralleling, especially to what's going on with companies now, because yes, you're right. They're saying, okay, we need to do the right thing. We need to, you know, have women on our board. And yet part of the reason they're doing it is because of fear, right? Fear of backlash. And that means that a lot of them are super uncomfortable, right? They're like, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. What, how do we let a woman in here? And so I use a whole lot of humor, right? That is one of my biggest secrets to success. I'm number one with the guys. I always assume that they want me there. Now, mm. is that true? No, it's absolutely not true. Some of them absolutely do not want you there. But if you look for a fight, you can always find one. Okay. Mm. And yet at the same time, I will take the power right out of your fight or what you perceive as an insult because I'm not going to let you win over me. And I say that because I've had women say, okay, well, what do you do, for example, in a boardroom, if a guy says, oh, you're tough? I said, oh, I say, thank you. And she said, but, you know, what if you know he's saying you're tough and he means it as an insult? Oh, I said, oh, I say, oh, my goodness, thank you so much. Because what he's not going to do is come back and say, oh, actually, I was trying to insult you. Okay. Right. What a bully does is try and pick on 
your insecurity. So I, I can make it seem like being tough or knowing your stuff or raising your voice is a negative. Then I am going to be in your head and I'm going to take some of your power away, some of your poise away, some of your position away. And guess what? He wins then. But if you don't give him that energy, if you're like, oh, thank you so much. I do agree. I am tough. I work hard. I go to the gym, whatever it is. Or mentally, yes, I'm a great negotiator. What he goes is, ooh, that didn't work. We all have pre-programmed responses in your mind, right? right. Well, we how we expect people to respond. And when you do not feed into those responses in the way that particularly bullies and insecure people will assume, then guess what? They don't know what to do with you. And they are likely not going to come back at you because they did not get the response that they need. So ladies, when we go into those situations, assume that you are wanted, make your cases known, make your voice valuable, add value where you can. And oh, by the way, develop allies, which means someone who will say, oh yeah, that was a good point, right? And I've done that with guys before. I've had players a lot of the times, like there was one staff I was on particularly that there was a coach who just could not stand that there was one on the staff. Every time I would say something, right? Like, let's say I was making this point to you. He would say, hey, you know, you know, I'm going to make that point. And he would just say it louder, right? Like the over talking. Right. And it was so obvious. The players would be like, oh, I'm sorry. The Hall of Famer is talking, right? Like, or, oh, yeah, Coach Jen, just say that. Or, Coach, do, were you finished? Right? And they diffused the situation because they didn't co-sign with him. And that's a really important power dynamic, right? Make sure that you develop allies and we find people who are going to enhance and make sure your voice is heard. And if you are that person, when somebody is new to the equation, make sure that you do that too. And oh, by the way, if somebody gives you a really hard time, ask him later, like, are you having a bad day? Are you okay? Because that seemed like a little aggressive to me. Sometimes they don't know. Mm -hmm. I always give everybody one mulligan, assuming that it was clearly a disconnect between brain and mouth. You could not have possibly meant to be so insulting. I also have a catchphrase that works. You do realize you said that out loud, right? Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> what it does is if they didn't mean to be that way and they or they didn't mean to say something that was off color, they will retract. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Right. We've all had those mm -hmm. moments where, you know, the words came out of our mouth and we kind of wished we could have them back. Yeah. But the other thing it does is it does set a standard that it's not OK. Right. And you didn't do it in a way that you were chewing them out or you were causing a fight. You kind of laugh about it, smile about it. But you did set a standard. And I do that often. And apparently yep. my players in the Cardinals used to say it was legendary. They were like, yeah. oh, that's a legend of Coach Jen. She will smile at you, keep it moving like you were her best friend, meanwhile knowing what you were all about. And they were like, we used to watch it like a thing of beauty. And I didn't even realize they knew until years later when they told me. Yeah, and that's interesting, you know, Coach Jen. It's uh, the reality that what we say, what we do, whether we defend ourselves or not, what we choose to do in a situation and, and even choosing to be silent in those times matter because it speaks volumes to people who, like like your colleagues, were watching you and were watching how you were going to react. And because that, uh, fortunately or not fortunately, and I think we connected on this point in, in, in one of the calls on Clubhouse, but being the first, being the only, is hard. Uh, but really? you have to take that responsibility and, and and take it very seriously because it sets the tone. And to that, um, talking about power dynamics, Dr. Jen, the elephant in the room that I, I must speak about, Sedona Prince, NCAA, and I even went to the lengths of printing this long tweet by Muffet McGraw from uh, Notre Dame, right, on, on the outrage that of the disparity between men's and women's sports and what she said was uh and i'll, I'll abbreviate this but in essence uh, this was the comparison of what the women's basketball players were getting versus the men um in the weight room uh you know really a huge disparity there and what Muffet McGraw says is hey guys you know this is hardly breaking news i've been fighting for this for years and frankly i'm tired of it i'm tired of turning on the tv to see ncaa basketball tournament to only realize that of course it means men's Tired of seeing March Madness and Final Four, da 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 da. 
But of course, it all means men's and women are hardly out of the equation. It's not just about the inequities in facilities, food, fan attendance, swag bags. It is that no one at the NCAA leadership bothered. And uh, it is an understatement of the century to say they dropped the ball on what they believe to be their mission, which is inclusion. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about your experience and what you view to be the case here of where women are in sports. And of course, you know, with your experience of the $12 check and the fact that you had to pay your way, even as uh, you got the call for, hey, you've got to represent America in America's sport. So, so talk to us about this and what you think. You are spot on. Um, you know, first of all, 4% of sports media coverage goes to women in sports, which as you know, being in venture capital, that translates into dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, 0.4% of sports sponsorship dollars goes to women in sports. Now, having seen the weight room comparison that Sedona pointed out versus what the guys got, it looked like about 0.4%. Right. It looked like they allocated those resources accordingly. So it was not shocking to any of the women who have been in sports for a long time. The power of it is, though, that it got other people engaged in the conversation that we've been having in our own circles. And that's not enough. Right. Women have the purchasing power. I heard it's between 70 and 80 percent. I've seen yeah. different estimates. But that means ladies have the power of the purse strings, which means we get to make the decision where we are going to invest our dollars, where we are going to take our families, where we want to put our money, where our passions are. And I really think that part of the reckoning has to be if you're not going to invest in women, then women should not invest our hard earned dollars in what you're doing. If mm. your station isn't going to broadcast women, guess what? I can watch something somewhere else, right? If your company is not being equitable, then I am going to take the power of my purse strings and put it elsewhere. Now, is that always possible? No, but if we start making concerted efforts to say we need to invest in women, we need to spend our money with women, we need to support our women, then we are shifting the power dynamic because the truth is, right, especially when it comes to sports, we know that sports translate into opportunities for young girls who become women. We know that women who play sports are more likely to find their way to the C-suites. We know these things. We know that confidence is, you know, for girls, they're more likely to have it if they played sports. We also know they're more likely to value their bodies, which means making choices towards, you know, um, substance abuse and, you know, teen pregnancy. We know that sports can do a whole lot of good things for our girls when we tell them to be in them. And yet the truth is that half of girls will opt out of sports by the time they finished puberty. And when asked those reasons, seven out of 10 said that they did not feel like society supported them in sports. Seven out of 10 said that they didn't feel like they belonged in sports. And seven out of 10 said there are not enough visible female role models in sports. We might tell them that they belong in sports and they can do whatever they want, but they see it everywhere else that that's not the case. They right. see what the WNBA gets versus the NBA. They see the weight room. They see the swag bags. They see mm -hmm. the salaries. And why would we then tell them that they're equal when society shows them everywhere they look that they're not represented, which means they're not equal. They are not as included, which means you're not as important. Yeah. So, so Dr. Jen, you know, the, the biggest critique that to, that I too have to handle and, and I wanted to get your uh, response. And this is of course, all over the Twitter sphere and all that, which is uh, the typical response of, Hey, guess what? Uh, the unfortunate fact is that men's games are more watched. That's where the dollars are. This is the reality. And until that changes, nothing's going to change because it's all about the dollars. So you know, given the fact that, and I'm all with you here, but what is, how would you reframe 
that thinking of, uh, yeah, this is the current reality. It's never really going to change. Well, the truth is when 96% of the sports media coverage goes to men's sports, guess mm -hmm. what we're telling people to do? Watch men's sports. Watch men's sports. Right. Like, you know, we're not seeing the same stories on women in sports, for example. Right. Women want to know the why they want to know the humans that are playing the game. For example, I basketball is not my sport. So guess what? I'm not watching basketball just because I love basketball. So what would make me watch basketball? Someone I care about. And guess what? If I don't know about anybody on the court, I'm not going to tune in, right? I'm not going to tune into men's or women's, but guess what? The likelihood of me knowing or hearing about LeBron James or Steph Curry or Kevin Durant, I could list tons and tons of men's basketball players. And yet we don't know about as many of the champions who are playing women's basketball. And guess what? Those women from the Atlanta dream, they shifted our political climate with their bravery. And guess what? Those are women I will tune in for. And you can teach me about basketball because they taught us about how society needs to move. So guess what? You're talking chicken and the egg when you say more people watch men's sports. Great. Right. So let's pay more attention to women's sports because guess what? When we pay more attention, when we tell those stories, when we show highlight clips, people will tune in. But if you just say, mm, more people watch men's sports, so we're not going to put money there. We're not going to do storytelling there. We're not going to change that dynamic. We're just going to throw our hands up and forget that it's not just the dollars that are important or the eyeballs, but those eyeballs are our children. And mm -hmm. them being raised that way is part of the problem, why the problem persists. Dr. Jen, that was a perfect note for us to end here because, you know, my work personally is all about fueling women's ambition, right? So what they want to aspire to be. And that's why having role models like you telling those stories matter, feeling their power, talking about purchasing power here, talking about just owning the power that they have. And finally, using their influence, right? So whether that's in their dollars, and we're doing that in the spaces that we can. And of course, you know, sports is something that is part of culture. It affects how we think and is a big part of what America is. And I'm so glad to have your voice really championing what matters, right? And, and to all of you tuning in there uh, here today, thank you for taking the time to tune in to us.